today can testify he's been faithful. He is a faithful God, amen? Hallelujah. Lord, as we look to your word this morning, let it become light and life to us. We acknowledge today, Lord, that we need you more than we've ever needed anything in this world. And so Holy Spirit, anoint these lips of clay. Give me clarity of communication today. Touch my physical body today as I communicate your word. We give you thanks for it in advance in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. This morning, we begin a series of messages on the churches of Revelation. As you know, John was the last of the living apostles. To me, it's very significant in the ministry of Jesus, three and a half years of public ministry, there were 12 disciples that he chose to walk with him. Of those 12, there were three that he spent more time with than he did the others, Peter, James, and John. Can you imagine the little dialogue that, that happened uh, along the way where the, Jesus would say to the guys, you know, Peter, James, and John are gonna go off for the weekend. You guys just kind of stay out of trouble till we get back. Can you see Matt saying to Bark, doesn't that tick you off when they go off with Jesus like that? And I can see Matt saying to Thomas, they ever ask you to go, Thomas? No, doubt they ever will. <laughs> and yet, there was one that Jesus was closer to than any of the rest of them. It was John. I believe Jesus knew, of course, being God, that John would be the last of the 12 alive, exiled to a rocky, rocky island called Patmos. And from that rocky island, John would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to give us the message of the end times. And from that rocky island, the Lord said, John, take your pen out. I need you to write some letters for me. To seven churches, these seven churches were real churches. They're not fictional churches. They were real churches in the area of Asia Minor, present day Turkey. And these were specific letters written to each of those seven churches. We are giving, given the letters to those seven churches because I believe there is a message, not just for seven actual churches in that day, but for all the churches of the kingdom. Can you imagine the excitement when somebody would, uh, Pastor Tom, somebody would, would say, oh, we just got a letter from the Lord. Everybody pay attention. And they would read this letter. And over the next several weeks, with a couple of uh, breaks in the interim, over the next several weeks, we're going to look at the letters to those seven churches because there's something that the Lord wants to say to this church, Calvary Church, out of all the messages to the other seven. Are you with me so far? So today, let's begin. Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from which you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The first letter to the church of Ephesus. He says, these things, says he, who holds 
the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the, go of the lampstands. The seven stars were the pastors of those churches and they are the messengers he holds in his hand. The lampstands represent the churches themselves and it is the Lord who walks among the lampstands. He is the Lord who walks among the churches. The seven lampstands are those churches. All of these letters have something to say to all of us. Jesus is the heartthrob of the church. He has no, it has no source that does not flow from his hand. It, there's no power to keep the light tended unless it comes from his hand. He is the center of it all. He's the one who gives the ministry that the church needs. In his hands are the stars. It all focuses on him. And he would say to all of us, who is this all about? Who is this all about? It's about me, Jesus. I am the source of it all. I am the one who's made it possible. And he walks among the lampstands. And he comes to this church and he says, I want to talk to you about not forgetting your source because you can't survive any other way. Verse two and three, he says, I know your works and your labor and your patience, and you cannot bear those things that are evil. This church has been faithful in eight counts. That's what the Lord says, eight ways. He doesn't come to this church with condemnation. He comes to this church acknowledging what they have done. He says, you will not tolerate things in your midst that are not proper. There was a church that was mindful of the ministry and Jesus says, I know that. And he makes four references here to the fact that this is a church that works. He also understood that this church had a fidelity to the truth. There was truthfulness a tenacity of spirit that said, we're going to see the work of God extended. You cannot bear them that are evil, Jesus says. I'm grateful that Calvary Church has had a pastor for 34 years that, that preached the truth of the word of God, preached the word of God with profound truth and faithfulness. So the foundation of this church is built upon the word of Almighty God. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. And the Lord says to, to this church at Ephesus, you have a tenacity of spirit. I think we would all agree here at Calvary, we've made up our mind that we're going to follow Jesus. The other thing the Lord says to them, he says, I know that you've tried those that are false apostles and found them to be liars. You have not allowed things to show up at your place that are not right. And you've dealt with things that were improper. You've borne and you've labored. You've been through travail over many, many years for various things. The travail piece is so, so powerful, the tenacity, the truthfulness and your travail. You see, what I realize is that in these days of transition for our church, as we get closer and closer to, to a new pastor, is that there, there are birth pangs for a new thing that God is wanting to do in this church. New plans, new designs, new things he is wanting to do. And with it comes a little stretching. Mm -hmm. I preached a message years ago at our church in Winston-Salem. Uh, it, got, it got a little publicity. This was the title of the message. Having a baby will stretch you. <laughs> and only the women in the room fully understood it. But here's the truth. When God is birthing something new, when God is birthing something fresh, even in a church, he stretches us out of our comfort zone. He stretches us out of the things that, that we were used to in the past, that we're comfortable with in the past. In the next few weeks, we're gonna be rolling out some new things here for us as we move forward uh, in these days at Calvary. 
but the birthing of, of a new thing that God wants to do. And I want to tell you, church, God is stretching us. If not anything else, your patience. Why don't we have a pastor yet? Because we're not ready yet. Because as soon as we're ready, our search committee is going to see the right one. I've done this a long time. I know how that works. The birthing of something new and fresh. Are we open? Are we open to God doing something fresh? Are we open to God doing something new in us and through us? I don't know about you, but I'm a candidate for something fresh. I'm a candidate for God to do something new in Ron. Can I get an amen about getting Ron fixed? I'm a candidate for that. The travail. And the Lord comes to them now, not with irritation, but he's saying, you know what? I have something against you. I want to press something into your life. There's something I want to bring to bear on you. I want to put this against you and have you feel the weight of it. Because I want you to be shaped by the pressure of this. It's not something I'm coming against you regarding to crush you. But he says, I want to reshape something inside of you that once existed. You've left your first love. What is the key to retaining first love? What is, it, what is it that first love is all about? And the Lord is saying, I need to bring something to bear upon you. I need you to be reshaped and refashioned back to an initial something. And it's a matter of love. If you could see the face of the Lord Jesus as he's communicating this, it would be with disappointment to start with. But he's pointing to the heart of what is essential to our fruitfulness, to the heart of the light, for the lampstand to stand continually. He's pointing to something that's vital to our being. He's calling us to become. He presses the point against us so that there will not be the losing, losing of his purpose in us. He says, the Lord is saying, I want you to recover your first love. You've lost sight of a fundamental thing, he's saying. You see, it's easy for us to get caught up in doing wonderful things, even for the kingdom of God, and miss Jesus. Remember the story of Martha, who was so involved in so many things, but Mary sought out the most important thing. You've left your first love, Jesus says. What are the characteristics of first love? Well, first love is a person. His name is Jesus. John says in his epistle, we love him because he first loved us. We recognize that a first love isn't so much a pattern of life as it is a person. When he says you've lost your first love, he says you've left the kind of relationship with me that you used to have. You've left the fountainhead. You're drinking, you're drinking too far downstream. And I've come to speak that into your life. What Jesus is saying to this church is, it doesn't make so much difference to you anymore as it used to about our love and our relationship. It's the Lord saying, do you remember when you first heard that I would provide for your every need? Do you remember the excitement when you'd bring situations to me and trust me? Do you remember when you first learned to pray more than just memorize prayers? Jesus is saying, you've learned a lot of principles and it's easy to become more excited with the principles than it is with the Prince of Peace. You can fall in love with love and worship worship and you can submit to submission and you can establish a kingdom and forget who the king is. You know, when Mary Magdalene encountered Jesus outside of that empty tomb, she didn't say, Jesus, teach me the doctrine of the resurrection. I don't think so. What she did, she said, Jesus. And she embraced him. You see,
See, you lose your first love when the substance becomes more important than the essence. When the mechanics are more important than the power. When the works are more important than love. And what Jesus is trying to say to his church, and he says to Calvary Church, I do not want you to not have the things that I've designed for you, and you won't have it if you lose touch with your source. And I have, I have to press this against you. You've gotten so occupied with the doing that you've forgotten the being. And he's calling us back to Christ-like simplicity. Jesus said, I want to bring this to bear upon you because your first love is lacking. Your worship has become very, very thin. I want to ask you, church, did you come here this morning excited about worshiping God together with other believers? Did you come here this morning saying, I, I've come today because I need a fresh touch from the Jesus? Did you come today saying, I need a fresh touch from the Lord in my life? Surely you didn't come just to go through the motions and sing with the worship team, those of you who do sing. Surely there's more to this than going through all this. I came here today to mimic the words of Jesus to say to this church as he did to the church of Ephesus, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And it's about Jesus. And when you lose sight of that, nothing else matters. <laughs> nothing else matters when you lose sight of that. You remember the Apostle Paul? Second Corinthians chapter 5. Here's what he said. He said, the Corinthians kind of think I'm crazy. You know why? Because the love of Christ has taken hold of me. The love of Jesus has so taken hold of me, I, I, I just can't be responsible for how I behave. The love of God has so penetrated my life. Some of you think I'm crazy because I'm so in love with Jesus. So the love of Christ compels me. It constrains me. It moves me along. When I realize that he died for me and rose again, I can't do anything but love him and serve him and give my life to him. The love of Christ has taken hold of me. If you have a child that has a fever, we refer to the fact that that fever has taken hold of that child. It's just, it's consuming that child, that, that, that baby, that two-year-old can be shaking and you can offer them ice cream and say, if I'll, I'll give you ice cream if you stop shaking. They're not gonna stop shaking. I, I'll, I'll give you a dollar if you just stop shaking. You see, the fever has taken hold of the child. And that's what Paul the Apostle is trying to say to us. The love of Christ has so taken hold of me. I can't help it. I have to serve him. I can't help it. I can't, I, I have to do what he's called me to do. I can't help it. I love him so much that, that, that some of you think I'm strange, but I'm just in love with Jesus. Wish more of us were strange, right? I'm just in love with Jesus. I remember many, many years ago uh, going to the ACC tournament over here at Greensburg Coliseum with my two sons. We had ticket to that, tickets to the tournament and uh, you know, we, we tried to get into the door dearest where we parked, which was a mistake. But we walked in the door, they took, they, you know, they took our tickets, uh, checked our tickets, we got in, and we discovered that uh, we were supposed to be way down that corridor to the right. But the, there was the mass of people coming in there, and the, the mass of people was going to the left while we were trying to go to the right, guess who won? Those people took us down the road, down that hallway to the left until we could get a, an exit spot to turn around and, and work our way back. What does Paul say? He said, I've been so taken hold of by, by the Lord Jesus and his love. He says, I'm just being moved along 
by the power of Jesus. I'm just being moved along by the presence of the Lord. I've been taken. I've been compelled. Lord, give me some more words to say. I have been possessed by the love of Jesus in my life. Jesus said, you've lost the source, the fountainhead of life, and it's a relationship with me. Is anybody getting this? Lord, just, just renew the power of your love in all of our lives today. Lord, help us to fall in love all over again. But the fountainhead of life, his name is Jesus. And then he says to this church, he says, you know, there's another, another thing I notice about you, he says, is that uh, you have those that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which you, you hate, and this is pretty strong language from the Lord himself, and he says, you know what, I hate that too. This church, he says, this church, you, you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and you know what, I hate it too. So here's the question, what are the Nicolaitans? What's the philosophy of the Nicolaitans? What's the theology of the Nicolaitans? Well, I'm glad somebody asked. I've been wanting to tell you this morning. The theology and doctrine of the Nicolaitans was that a select group of people in the church ran the church, did all the ministry in the church, and everybody else had kind of just sat around and followed those leaders. And the Lord said, I hate that doctrine. Because what that doctrine does is, instead of, instead of there being a river that flows out of that church to touch a world, all we've got is a little trickle from a spout. Because what the Lord is trying to say, he says, I hate anything that would cause the church to not realize that all of them have been called, all of them have been gifted, all of them have a ministry to do for my kingdom. You know, my ears have stopped up, but I didn't think there was a lot of amens right there. Uh, the Lord says, I hate anything that would limit my church. Can I go ahead and just say it, church? If 25 to 30% of people who call Calvary Church home are the ones involved in ministry and the rest of us are on the premises, God cannot do what he wants to do at this church. Because God's plan for this church is everybody is do, are doing something with the gifts he's given them to fulfill the biblical mandate. And a de, no, that's not a devil can stop that church. I said, it's not a devil can stop that church. And, and the Lord says, you know what? I hate that spirit. I hate that attitude where a few people are doing all the ministry and the rest are sitting on the premises. Calvary Church, if you wanna hire a pastor that's gonna do all this, then you're not gonna find one because that's not the ministry of your pastor. The pastor is to train and develop you for ministry. The church is to function. All the gifts, all the talents. I can tell this is going over big, but I'm gonna keep preaching it until somebody gets it. Because if you only realize from God's standpoint, he says there's a little trickle of stuff coming out of Calvary Church of wonderful, dedicated people. But boy, if I could ever get all of them functioning and flowing. Oh my gosh, there'd be a river. There'd be a river flowing out of this place to impact Greensboro and the rest of the world. <laughs> the Lord says, I, I hate that, that, that mentality. And I know you do too, church because it compresses the church from being what God called it to be. And then verse seven, he who has ears to hear, let, let, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I'm glad we finally got there. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat. In other words, what he's saying is, those who arise above those circumstances that come against them, 
the person who's able to stand in the face of the adversary, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Now, I do not believe that's just talking about heaven, brothers and sisters. I believe that's talking about some here and now. Here's the picture. When you go back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were cast out of that garden. And the Bible says two cherubims, angelic creatures with flaming swords, kept them away from the tree of life because of their sin. Now Jesus is saying to his church, I've redeemed you. I've opened the way for you to come back to Eden again. See, Eden has to do with essentially two things. Number one, Eden was the place of man's fullest relationship with God. When he walked with God on a daily basis and loved him, and there was a sense of his presence 24-7. That's what Eden was like when Adam walked with God. The second thing about Eden, it was a place where man was in dominion. He was created to have large significance. Eden is before man was crushed with his own sense of shame because of sin. And here's what the Lord is saying, I want to usher back into your, a relationship with you and a rulership with you. And so the Lord is saying to him who overcomes, I will give to eat at the tree of life. Come on, somebody get this right now. Pay attention, somebody, right here. Here's what the Lord is saying. To those that overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which means that we, you and I are gonna walk together in relationship where you feel my presence 24 seven, where we walk together in love. That's what our relationship's gonna be like. And secondly, I'm gonna take you back to like it was in the Garden of Eden where you have dominion again. Yes. Where you have dominion again. And I'm, here's what I'm talking about. Right here and now, you can have dominion over the works of hell. Right here and now, there are people right, oh Jesus, help me. There are people right now in this room who desperately need dominion over what the devil's doing to your family. There are people right now in this room who desperately need dominion over your finances. People who need dominion over what's going on at your job, your workplace. And the Lord says, I wanna give you back dominion over the enemy's work in your life, in your home, in your family, and in your church, so that you will reign again and you will be above it all. Come on, somebody. To him who overcomes. I'm gonna give you the privilege of eating of that tree. Again, because you're a redeemed son and daughter of the almighty God. We're gonna to walk together in a close relationship with each other. Will you hear my heart every day? Will you feel me as your source? And you're gonna worship like you've never worshiped before because I'm with you and you sense the power of my love and my presence. And secondly, I want to give you dominion over anything that hell would come against you with. I wanna give you dominion over the works of darkness. Hallelujah. 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 Relationship and dominion. Are there any takers today? Relationship and dominion. Hallelujah. And so Lord, in these final moments now, would you take the truth of your word, penetrate our hearts. Lord, as you came to the church at Ephesus, saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us as a church, Calvary Church, have ears to hear what your Spirit's saying to us today. Lord, recover our first love for you. Bring us back to that intimacy we once had with you. Bring us back to that place, Lord. Lord, give us the power to overcome so that we can eat of the tree of life again. Do that work by your Holy Spirit. With our heads bowed in the room for just a moment, 
I want to pray for people here in the house, first of all, today. We say, Ron, I'm here today. And I need Jesus to touch my life and change it. I need Jesus to forgive me of my past and give me a new start, a new beginning. Maybe you're in the house, that's you, or beyond the walls of this room right now, I'm talking to you as well. In the next few moments, you can experience a miracle in your life. Jesus is the miracle worker. And so if you're in this house or beyond the walls of this room, you say, Ron, would you include me in that prayer? I need Jesus to change my life. Forgive me of my past and give me a new start. God can't help you till you're willing to admit you need him. But once you admit that you need him, he'll run to you with his love. He'll run to you with his grace. And so with our heads bowed, it's me and you and Jesus right now. How many in the house would just say, Ron, that's me. Would you include me in that prayer? I need Jesus to touch my life and change it. Say, that's right. Just raise it up high. Wherever you're at. Yes, ma'am, right over here. And right over here, sir. And back here and right here, sir. And right over here, ma'am. Wherever you're at, just raise it up high. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Several hands just right over here, sir. I agree with you today. I'm gonna believe with you for God's miracle today. Somebody else, that's me. Yes, right here, sir. I agree with you. I'm believing with you today for God's miracle in your life. Yes, sir. Anybody else wanna be included? I've seen hands all over the room. This is your moment. This is the day of victory for you. This is the day of release for you. But it requires, first of all, decision to admit and acknowledge before the Lord, Lord, I got, I need your help. I need you to change my life. That's what your hand raised means. I need you to change my life, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, ma'am, I see it. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna pray together. We're gonna believe together in the next few moments for God to do that work. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody, but I, I just, it's so important that you make your stand for Jesus today. He died for you. And now I'm gonna ask you to stand for him. We're gonna to pray together right where you're at. But if you're mid-business when you raise your hand and you're gonna believe with me as I pray that prayer in the next few moments, I'm just gonna ask you to quietly stand right where you're at. Just quietly stand right where you're at. Say, Ron, I'm mid-business when I raise my hand. And you're gonna make your stand for Jesus this morning. And we're gonna to pray together right where you're at. Go ahead, just, if you raise your hand, just quietly stand right where you're at right now. That's right. Just make your stand right now. That's right. Just make your stand right now. That's right. Just make your stand. That's right. Wherever you're at. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you need to stand with people who are standing right now in this auditorium. You need to make your stance today. Thank God that couples are standing. Singles are standing. Men and women are standing all over this house right now. We're going to believe together. We're going to pray together in the next few moments. And I'm going to ask those of you who are standing to pray a prayer with me. And the Bible says if it comes from your heart, God's going to hear it. And you're going to receive his forgiveness and his touch today in the next few moments. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that he came forth from the grave, we can be saved and we can be changed. And so if those of you are standing, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Pray it out loud from your heart. And others in the congregation who love Jesus and love you are going to pray it with you in agreement in the next few moments. We're going to pray it together. So let's do that right now. Dear Jesus, just pray it out loud. Dear Jesus, I open my heart to you today. I believe you came to this earth. You gave your life. You paid the penalty for my sin. And today I open my heart to you. I invite you to change my life today. Forgive me of my past. Give me a new beginning today. From this day forward, I choose to walk with you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for touching my life today. From this day forward, I will walk with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Oh, church, let's give God praise in this house. Come on. Hallelujah. Everybody standing. Everybody standing. Hallelujah. 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 Those of you who prayed that prayer with me, maybe there was a time when 
you walked with the Lord, but today you're walking afar off, or maybe this is the first time you've prayed that prayer and invited Jesus into your life. There's a connect card there in the pew, right, right in front of you, a little orange card. Would you just take a moment, put your name there and just indicate today uh, I received Jesus into my life and uh, make sure that it's left in the buckets or on the table as you go out today. We want to follow up with you for the decision you're making for Jesus. But today, I want to challenge everybody who names the name of Jesus in the house. It's time to fall in love again. I said it's time to fall in love again. He is our source. He is the only source. He's the only source. So would you just take a moment right now, let, let where you're standing just be a, an altar. And say, Lord, just renew my love for you. Just renew my relationship with you today, Lord. Would you just lift a hand and just say, Lord, just, just renew my, my relationship with you today, Lord. Just renew my love for you today, Lord. Just penetrate my heart again, Lord. Let me sense and feel the power of your love again in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.